my point. I don't need to demonstrate that point, okay? <laughs> it's hard to do, and Jesus will, God will help you to do that. All right, so let's go into this passage here a little bit more, and look what's behind it. We already looked at this. How many times, Peter asked, should we do this? Like, what if someone goes astray, and then I talk to them, and it's really hard, and then they come back, and they're reconciled to the church? Okay, because that's the context here, right? We look at the whole context. And then they do something else, or they do the exact same thing again. And then I go to them, and they don't listen to me, and then I take Tim with me, and, and, and we go, and, and they listen to us. Ah, so hard to do that. But we did it with the right attitude, and they come back. And then they do it again, and they leave. And then it's like, okay, come on, guys, we got to go get them back. Like, how many times do we have to forgive them after they've come back and reconciled and become part of the body of believers again and then leave again? And he says, over and over and over and over and over again. It's interesting here. This context is not about people who are unrepentant and not interested in reconciling. This context is about bringing them back in again and again and again and again. And I think it's so important as Christians, as a body of believers, to make sure other people know that. So there's nobody in our community, in our church, who feels like, ugh, I just did that sin again. They're never going to accept me back. No! No! We are going to keep each other accountable to do this and to bring people back again and again and again. 70 times 7, 70 and 7, it doesn't matter. A gazillion times. That's the meaning here. Do it a gazillion times. Let's go on, because what Jesus does now is he tells a parable. We've got to remember when we look at parables to explain this a bit more. Parables, Jesus used parables to explain something familiar, took something familiar, which is debt. <laughs> I think some of us are familiar with debt too, unfortunately, to explain something unfamiliar. And the familiar always makes sense to the people who heard it. And so if you're sitting here, 2023 in Taiwan, and you're Australian maybe, it might be a different cultural context, and you don't understand exactly what was meant. But the people that it was spoken to, that's the context we want to look at. And Jesus usually may use parables to make one or two points. And jumping down to the very, very last one, it's important that we don't try to pack everything into every parable. If Jesus tells us what the parable is about, then that's what it means, period, end of discussion. We don't have to pull like in, oh, the end times and Satan and the fall and all these. No, no, no. It's a parable for a point, not a parable to explain all of theology and like a pilgrim's progress type of a story. No, it's one parable for a point for the people that understood the familiar to explain that unfamiliar to them. And so go ahead. Parable, Jesus tells his parable to them. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 bags of gold, that phrase, again, is one of those numbers that means a billion gazillion, okay? It's not actually 10,000 bags of gold. It just means an enormous amount. In fact, they were one of the commentaries I read said that amount is actually what the entire area of Palestine brought together for their yearly tax, okay? So that's how big this amount is was brought to him. So this guy owed. So obviously this is a, 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 a parable. Nobody owes that much money. It's just, it's so much. Since he was not able to pay the master, the, since, sorry, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Everything, including family, okay? At this time, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me. Patient. Like, how long would this take? You see the absurdity of that statement? He says, be patient with me. Uh, this would take a whole country a very long time to repay. It's not like your mama and I, just one step, one step, a little bit at a time. You know, the, tomorrow I won't go to Starbucks, and hopefully by the end of the month we'll be okay. No, this is absurd, this amount of money. He says, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity or the word that's used here is also used in the Bible for compassion on him. He canceled the debt, and he let him go. The amount was so absurd. There was absolutely nothing this man could have done. He had everything to lose, 
and he begs for mercy. And the king says, okay. I'm not going to give you a payment plan. I'm not going to ask you to do your best. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to wipe it completely clean. Let it be known that you have nothing to do with this repayment. None of it is by your own power because it's way too much. Story goes on, and you know the story. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him. <laughs> I don't know why I do sound effects, but I do. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Now we're talking about a hundred silver coins. A large amount, but doable. And you'll notice the wording. I don't know if you remember from the previous slide. Jesus uses the exact same phrase for both people. He says, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Josh, can you go back one slide real fast so we see that? Okay. Here he says, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. It's the same wording. Go ahead and go back forward again. Thanks. But he refused. So the response was totally different. Same situation, same request, but the response was different. He said he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Go ahead. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. And that idea of torturing is torturing until you get it back, until he should pay back all that he owed, which is what? Never impossible. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Again, one thing I want to say here. It's a parable to talk about debt and how it is impossible for us to repay our debt. We don't need to try to figure out, oh, see, now this, so if you do something wrong, then God's going to actually punish you even though you've, you're a Christian and da-da-da. That's, that's something totally different. This story is about debt. and You can't repay it. And you are freely forgiven. And that servant was happy to receive that forgiveness of debt. But he was not willing to give the gift of the forgiveness of debt in something that he could control. He received it for something he couldn't control. He was unwilling to give it for something that he could control. And this is how my Father in heaven will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. We read it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You see, forgiveness is a core part of who we are. We are a forgiven people therefore we are a forgiving people we were forgiven our identity is we are forgiven people and because from that identity of being forgiven people we forgive other people our identity leads to our action not our action leads to our identity no it comes from who i am as a forgiven person i will be forgiving Let's look at two quick passages here in Ephesians and in Colossians. And I always want to have things in context, um, but we're going to focus on the colored part here. And this is about living in community with each other. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. But instead, be like this. It says, be kind, be compassionate to one another. Colossians, a parallel thing, verse here. It says, Fill with, be filled, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. And then it says this, forgiving each other. Bear with each other and forgive each other. And now, we move away from the Old Testament covenant. We move away from the an eye for an eye, a bilateral covenant, and we move into a unilateral covenant, a covenant of grace. Where what we do is not what we would do to other people, but what we do is as Christ did for us. It's how we love other people. 
Not the way we love ourselves, but the way Christ loved us. Okay? So we're in, a whole new, we're in a whole new paradigm here. But forgive just as Christ, in Christ God forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love. We cannot be a loving community if we are not a forgiving community. It's that simple. And if we are not a forgiving community, we're not a loving community. Let's go on. I'm going to pull this together for us here. How did God forgive me? It was very costly to him. And it's costly for us to forgive people. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That was the price, to become sin, and then to die to pay for that sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It was undeserved. God demonstrates his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Not after I'd accomplished something and then Christ filled in the rest. You know, do your best and then God will take care of the rest. That's not biblical, okay? It was while I was undeserving. It was free to me, for it's by grace I have, you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Here's the hardest one for me. It's permanent. Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? It's so far. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how great his love is. As far as the east is away, f- away from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions, he's removed our sins from us. And here's what we do, though. We ask for forgiveness. And we just can't believe that God would really do that. But I've done it 38 times this week, Lord. And he says, oh, you still haven't hit a gazillion yet. It's okay, you know, I forgive you. I forgive you. It's that far it's removed, as far as the east is from the west. I know for some of us, it's not just me in this room here, there are things that we just can't believe God would forgive. And we go to his word, and he says, if we are if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You see, God's word is true or it's not true. And if it's true and you confess your sin, then he will forgive you and he will restore you and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that sometimes takes time to just, to just meditate on that. You know, and my wife who's got her degree in counseling now she told me something really interesting a lot of times brain research now tells us too that we might believe something in our head in our mind but our bodies still need a few more years to catch up you know that our 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 um our brains like we we intellectually know that god's forgiven us but our body hasn't quite caught up to what we know in our minds already and just to be patient just to be patient be patient with yourself too and keep going back to the truth that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Personally, let's go one more slide here. I want to make sure I add this because I've sat in sermons by pastors on forgiveness and I think some very damaging things were said. If you loan somebody your car, they drive it and they crash it and they ask for forgiveness, you should give them the keys again. No. No. Absolutely incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. See, forgiving something is an internal issue. It's not where you say, okay, this person has wronged me terribly. And let me, we're all high school age and above here. If someone has harmed you terribly, if someone's harmed your kids terribly, if you have been in an abusive situation, forgiveness does not mean that you go back or you send your kids back again and again and again. See, that's, They gave up their right to be repaid, but they didn't give up their safety, okay? So you need to really understand that, okay? Forgiveness is that you have come to an inner place where you have forgiven them, and you can move on even though it will hurt forever. But you are not ever expected or required to go back into that situation or to put your kids back into that situation. And I have to say that, sorry, it's kind of a damper and a downer here as we're talking about the amazing gift of forgiveness, but I want you to understand that. For me, for us, we have to understand that it's hard. We love being forgiven. It's really hard to forgive. They may not deserve it, 
or they may not even ask for it. It will be freeing for me. And this is those of you who have studied, again, brain and psychology and, and education, a lot of you, the, 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 the freedom you get when you can say you no longer get to weigh me down with what you've done. I'm going to take that off, I'm going to put it down, and I'm going to forgive you. And it's just such a freeing thing. And then ask God to help you not to hold a grudge, because we're really good at that one. Ah, but last year he did this. Ah, you know, maybe one of your spouses is really good at holding a grudge. If you think that, if you're thinking of your spouse right now, it's actually you, okay? <laughs> so let's get that straight. If you're thinking, see, yeah, hey, talk about this to my wife later or my husband later, it's probably you. You're probably the one. But it's who we are. From our identity come our actions. We are a forgiven people. Therefore, we are a forgiving people. Everything I heard today, read today is true. What do I need to do in my own life? If everything I heard and read today is true, who do I need to tell? We'll put up the study questions if you want to do that later. And uh, I'll pray for us, and then we'll have our musicians come up for a closing song. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us completely. On the cross, you said, it is finished. And what's finished is your redeeming work. You're living a perfect life. You being perfect, taking on and becoming sin and paying that in full. And Lord, that's so hard for me to understand. I always think there's like a little bit more I need to do. There's a little bit more I need to do. Surely you can't be that forgiving. I don't know anybody who's that forgiving. But Lord, that's not true. You completely, totally forgive us. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from, from us. Lord, as I, as I look at other people and, and, and carry the hurt of what people have done to me and, and also I'm aware of the hurt that I've caused in other people, well, Lord, would you help me to remember that I am a forgiven person? And that as a result of being a forgiven person, you ask me to forgive others too to offer, to ask for forgiveness from others, but also to offer forgiveness. And Lord, as we, we read earlier in, the, in the, 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 the guidelines you gave us for confronting sin, Lord, I pray that you would help me to find the courage to find one or two people to do this together. Lord, for all of us, we're not meant to do this alone. We're meant to live as a body. We're meant to live in community. Would you give us the courage and the transparency to talk to people so that we can do this together? Thank you that you're here. Thank you that you can fill our hearts with your peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as a response.